Mm. Taufik Iskandar, good to have you, man. Thank you, Sushwang. Uh, what an honor, what a privilege, what a pleasure. Um, I couldn't help but notice the, um, the book that you brought along with you because I know you're well-read, uh, highly um, interested in everything and, and everyone around you. And I want to talk about the book. Let's start off with the book, actually, you, you, you brought with you because it's John Kay and Mervyn King. Mervyn King, of course, formerly of the Bank of England. Um, yeah. And the title of the book is, I think, something to do with the unpredictability of the world we find around us, right? Yeah. So, um, what brings you to read about this, this uh, topic? Thank you, Sutrang, for giving me the opportunity to be heard. Um, actually, to be honest, the right answer is I've got a series of books that are still pending my time, <laughs> pending my read. Uh, but I thought this is very apt. Uh, the title of the book is Radical Uncertainty. And one thing I like about it, which I think is very relevant uh, to today's world, is actually the difference between what we understand by risk as well as uncertainty. So the book talks about the technical definition of risk, which we know and we apply in our uh, in capital market, in our invest, uh, investment, in our investing philosophy, as well as economics. But the uncertainty is a greater concept than that. So that's why I think it's, it's, it's certainly entertaining read for me. Risk you can quantify. Risk right. you, can, you can put uh, probabilities and numbers behind them and you can kind of like justify outcomes. Mm -hmm. Uh, unpredictability you can't yeah. and it's been something which has been growing of increasing with increasing momentum the last few years mm -hmm. um, as evidenced by the in fact the last two or three years mm -hmm. in fact we've just come from an outcome which is completely unpredictable as well in mm -hmm. Malaysia right mm -hmm. how do you look at these issues and mm -hmm. and cater for them not just in life but in markets mm -hmm. in investing let me go to the basic. If you recall what Donald Rumsfeld did in one of his press conference uh, in, 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 um, in justifying a, a war uh, in the Middle East, he mentioned three classifications of risks, right? The known knowns, uh, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. So based on this book, uh, actually the latter, the unknown unknown, is what we know as uncertainty. The first two is actually risk, where you can actually assign uh, a balance of probabilities, distribution of probabilities of outcome uh, to risk assessment. Uh, so the uncertainty is something that you do not know. And the function of uncertainty is actually ambiguity, um, ill-defined problem, uh, ignorance. So the only solution for uncertainty is really to do research to really get as much information as possible. So in this book in particular, he, uh, they gave an anecdote about how Barack Obama actually made a decision whether actually to say yes to the uh, SWAT uh, uh, assault on, on, on Osama's house in, in Pakistan. Nobody's, nobody knew at the time that Obama, uh, sorry, Osama was in the house, right? So that is uncertainty. And you need to uh, make a judgment based on how much information can you gather. So that is the idea of uncertainty. And you mentioned about the current situation. So is it really uncertain? So this is where I think when it comes to investing, and, and that's also my philosophy, is actually back to the future. If you recall that movie in 1985s, uh, I was actually growing up uh, in 1980s and 1990s at one of my favorite uh, um, uh, uh, movies when I was a kid. Is back to the future. You need to get back to, to the past in order to understand what's going to happen in the future. So basically, market is a distillation of historical events, but of course we need to adapt because the outcome may not necessarily be the same, right? We've heard this, history rhymes. Uh, um, so that is, to me, is how we actually um, deal with uncertainty. Yeah, so if the, um, at, if the panacea to mm. uh, uncertainty is knowledge and research, right? Mm, mm. So then I want to cast your, your mind back to November 2021, mm. um, when just about everybody was caught by surprise mm. by the pace of inflation mm -hmm. and the pace of the announcement of the rate hikes. Mm -hmm. But it was not a surprise because everybody knew mm -hmm. that these things were coming, right? Mm -hmm. So even the smartest people, including mm -hmm. Kathy Wood of ARC, mm -hmm. lost their pants, mm -hmm. in the, has, have lost their pants in the mm -hmm. last... 12 months. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if they haven't seen it coming. I mean, we've seen during the Volcker era in mm -hmm. the 70s, mm -hmm. interest rates hit as high as I can't remember, 15-20%. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. we knew, we knew th this, this era was coming, but everybody was caught off guard. Mm -hmm. And these are some of the most knowledgeable, well-researched, 
highly read individuals. You're right, you're right. So, so how do you explain that? In retrospect, uh, uh, I'm thankful that I can actually comment, right? Because I've got um, um, information that is now public. Uh, but central banks also made mistakes, right? Uh, you mentioned 1970s. But recall two years ago, one and a half years ago, they're still adamant that this is transitory. Yeah, and exactly. we know in 1970s exactly. it's more persistent. Yeah. Uh, and the trigger was a war in Yom Kippur. That's exactly what we've seen here. There are secular forces towards inflationary environment, but the real war actually led to the imbalance in the uh, um, demand supply of commodities that led to soaring prices. So why didn't they spot this as more persistent than just transitory? Right? Because so they were in denial and maybe they were captured by the capital markets, Wall Street, right? Exactly. And if you ask me, I think capital market is also in the belief that uh, Jerome Powell is more of incarnations of uh, Arthur Burns than incarnations of Paul Walker. So, you, so in other words, they think that Jerome Powell will not be as harsh as Paul Volcker and will actually dial back the moment you see inflation starts to slow down. That's exactly what happened in 1970s when Arthur Byrne actually start to slow down, right? The moment inflation slows down, but it's more persistent. But what does the Federal Reserve think is going to happen after 12 years of monetary easing? Mm -hmm. It's been money's been free or near as free for the last 12 years. Mm -hmm. What do they think was going to happen? But I want to stop you there because if it's so difficult for the most erudite and learned people mm -hmm. on Wall Street and the re around the world, mm -hmm. what about the rest of us? Because I'm trying to like, um, I mean, the whole idea of why we talk about financial literacy is to make mm -hmm. it accessible to everybody, right? Mm -hmm. Not just the uh, privileged and, and educated and, mm -hmm. and affluent. Mm -hmm. um, to me, and my firm belief is that financial literacy mm -hmm. is one of the gateways to uh, contentment mm -hmm. and, and enlightenment in a way, for, for want of a better word, right? Mm -hmm. How, how does the individual who, who mm. seeks financial literacy mm. navigate what is essentially a very, very unpredictable world, mm. which is getting more unpredictable every day? Okay. Um, I'm pretty sure you are also very well read, uh, Su Chuang. And you may have come across this book by Nicholas, uh, Nicholas uh, Talib called Anti-Fragile. That's right. And if you are um, a fan of Netflix like me, you may have watched Billions. And That's Taylor right. Mason, one of the characters mentioned, be anti-fragile or die. That's right. Right? Anti-fragile is more than just resilience and robustness. You, it, it thrives when you actually uh, celebrate disorder. So first, we need to admit that we are in a world full of risks. We are in a world full of the unknowns or uncertainties. How do we adapt is what is more important. So how do we adapt? We need to be responsive, we need to do research, we need to gather as much information and make sense. And, you know, Warren Buffett mentioned, investing is all about common sense. And to me, to do very well in capital markets, or even in our daily lives, in ability to discern patterns. And that ability comes from how much information you have at your disposal. So well, if you ask about financial literacy, it's all about gathering that. Okay, well, the problem is you, you and I know that humans are complex creatures. Yes, you're right. There are some humans who thrive on uncertainties. That's why they love the startup culture. Mm -hmm. And there are, there are others who cannot enter a startup because they, are just, they cannot do without structure and framework. Mm -hmm. For those people who mm -hmm. do crave structure and framework, who cannot survive mm -hmm. in an unstructured world, mm -hmm. what, is, does that spell the death knell for them in today's era? No, I don't think so, Sir Chua. So how do they overcome that? Right. You need to understand, differentiate between risk and uncertainty. More often than not, we cannot deal with uncertainty uh, without as many information as we gather, right? But what we can do is we deal with risk. And this is the balance of probabilities. Uh, Benjamin Graham, Warren Buffett mentioned margin, margin of safety. When we do investment, when we actually um, uh, assessing upside and downside, our focus is pretty much on the upside. We try to maximize upside. We try to buy because the target price is, uh, is giving us a 20% upside. But actually, investment is all about managing risk. It's all about downside protections. So if you ask me, uh, go back to the very basic, understanding how much can you tolerate uh, losses. And similarly, when I make a decision in my life, I also know what is my cutoff, what is my tolerance towards losses, failures, um, and that is how I actually manage risk. Similarly for investment as well. So you really need to know. And for investment, that margin of safety, that tolerance, depends on, I know people mention your appetite, but actually it depends on your cost of capital. If you get your money from your father, you can actually maybe have huge margin of safety. 
But if you actually borrow to invest, yeah, maybe you okay. have to think more okay. about that. Before yeah? we try and get to the, you know, I guess to the more everyday uh, lingo and narrative, mm. just want to get your point of view because when you talk about uh, margins of safety mm. and, and downside protection, mm. I think the distinction has to be drawn because um, a lot of people, I mean, obviously you are a professional investor, mm. right? You, you have come from the um, fund management side of the equation. Mm -hmm. So the money that you managed has been on behalf of other people, right? Mm -hmm. Who mm -hmm. do depend on you for performance mm -hmm. and downside protection. Mm -hmm. So your margin of safety is probably less cushiony mm -hmm. rather than an individual investor, a retail investor, someone like myself, mm -hmm. who maybe can, can stomach more downside because it's the money that I make mm -hmm. and, 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 and I, can, I can take, for example, the 65% drop in mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in, in Bitcoin the last mm -hmm. 12 months. Mm -hmm. And I can take it out because I know in 10 years' time, mm -hmm. it's going to be a, a much, much higher than where it is today. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people don't realize that because when we talk to financial investors, mm -hmm. professionals like yourself, mm -hmm. maybe we, we don't realize that you are speaking on behalf of the professional side mm -hmm. rather than the retail side. Yeah. Okay. Uh, coming back to that so-called margin of safety or downside protections, right? I mean, we know about derivatives. Yeah. And the functions of derivatives is key critical components would be interest rate, uh, time, uh, volatility, uh, strike price. I use a normal lingo for normal people. What do you need, right? And you mentioned if you manage institutional money, that means you can have relatively big margin of safety. No, you can't because, because if you lose too much money, then people will start to lose faith in you and they call their funds back, right? Yeah, but, but that is what the textbooks uh, uh, mention, so strong. More often than not, they are actually more risk averse. And that's a problem we have in Malaysia, right? Uh, if the market is dominated by pension funds, they're risk averse. Institutional funds, risk averse. Have you come across, sorry to say, one of the sovereign wealth funds in the country, a lot of people complain they are not taking enough risk. But you're right, they should be taking more risk. But the problem is they are not taking. Why? This is because I think, um, you don't really understand your concept of the concept of cost of capital. For example, you may have come across, um, and this is where I actually differ from a common, common, common wisdom. Um, you are in, a, you know, in a pension fund in Malaysia. So my 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 investment objective is uh, to give return that is higher than inflation. But what is inflation that you're aiming for? Is it two percent? Just because uh, pension is, you know, a uh, 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 policy is that giving you an increment of 2% a year? What is inflation in this country? That is question number one, right? Because that is interest rate if you are doing derivatives. Um, what is time? What is your investment horizons? How often do we, are we incentivized by short-termism? A KPI, annual income target, ROI, return on investment, which is actually marked yearly. Again, when you can actually invest for 10 years, you can invest for 30 years. Your sovereign wealth funds, you shouldn't be having an annual KPI. I mean, that's my point. Uh, I mean, we actually sum it up uh, into a very nice investment objective. But is it really true? A true reflection of the needs of our stakeholders? Okay, so I want to put a, a hypoth hypothetical situation to you, Taufik. Mm. You have been asked to give a talk to Form 6 students mm -hmm in uh, Bagan Sarai, okay? Mm -hmm. Mixed class, right? Mm -hmm. All about 17, 18 years old, some mm -hmm. Malay boys, some Chinese boys, some Indian boys, right? Mm -hmm. And they are embarking on this huge, brave new world of adulthood, mm -hmm. okay? Um, the subject is financial literacy. Mm -hmm. What are the principles you impart to them? First, I will ask, why do you invest? Do you invest because you want to actually grow your saving spot so that it can fund your uh, tertiary education? Why do you invest? Is it because you want to buy your first house? Why do you invest? Is it because for your retirement? Because that sets you the critical cost of capital. So I role play the boy. I say, sir, why must I invest in the first place? Why don't I just have a salary and uh, just live on my salary? Yeah, if it's possible. But yeah, but that is, that is not investing. That is, uh, that is just living by, you know, day to day, right? If, sir, what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong about it. Right? There's nothing wrong about it, but you need to understand income and wealth are two different things. You can work daily, and that's a function of our labour. We can work as much as we can in a day, and we can get as much over time as in, in a day, but that's income. But the higher you earn, it not necessarily means you have a higher wealth. 
So wealth is a bigger problem, it's a bigger concept. We invest not because to grow our income, we invest because we want to grow our wealth. So I, I made 3,000 ringgit a month uh, if I start my job. I don't have any money left over. How do I invest? First, again, I go back to the very basic, so strong. Why do you invest? Because you really need to know what is your so-called cost of capital. And that's cost of capital. If, you, if it's actually funded by your income, you know it is like grant in, in, in institutional lingo, right? It doesn't, have, it doesn't have a predetermined hurdle rate for it. But you need to know why you invest because it determines the real rate of return that you need. That's one. Number two, you also need to know your time horizon. Like I said, if you invest because you want to fund your first house, when do you want to have your first house? When you're in 30s? When you're in 20s? Because that also determines your risk-taking uh, activities, your risk appetite. Um, what else? You also need to know about your uh, um, uh, attitude towards volatility so that you know whether you can be tactical, taking short-term uh, or long-term in nature. So again, that is that is a, a very basic of understanding what is your investment needs. Yeah, but at that age, right, these kids, what do they know about volatility or, or time frames or risk profiles? Mm. They are just trying to make it in the world, you know what I mean? And I think a lot of Malaysia, a lot mm. of, in fact, a lot of the world, mm. um, we don't have that financial literacy, right? Yeah. That, that's why we're duped with, with advertising and, and mm. so-called shysters all the time. Yeah. And we make a lot of mistakes. I mean, people make a lot of mistakes, you know, in scams. Yeah, but Su uh, um this is where potentially I differ uh, with you. I think we cannot underestimate our millennials, the young ones. I think they actually have some form of uh, appreciations uh, about investing, you know. Many of them are in bitcoins. Uh, many of them are trading forex, thinking that they will make uh, enough savings. Uh, the need to actually uh, grow their wealth. They do know that. The problem is they don't have enough information to know what asset class for them, what is actually suitable for them, how to invest. Uh, not about whether they want or they don't want to invest. More often than not, if uh, uh, these young ones are actually quite actually investment savvy. Okay, that's interesting. It's interesting. And of course, that you probably think that way because at no other point in history have they had so much information at their disposal, mm. right? Mm. So how, what kind of advice would you give or what kind of like interpretations would you talk about to, to, to young people? Mm. Because right now, the, the, the sheer variety mm. of asset classes is, is off the scale. Mm. It's never been more diverse and more mm. broad, right? Mm. And how would you read the markets? because this seems to be a very unique time mm. in the time scale of humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there are opportunities um, in the market, right? Um, I would like to talk about these five secular forces. I keep mentioning uh, to my colleagues, to my friends. First is, we are moving from an era that is dependent on monetary access to fiscal access. Gone are the days, uh, the era of the only game in town. You know what I mean? Central banks mm. determining. The balance is now moving from monetary to fiscal. Uh, second is... Hang on, what do you mean by that? That means we're more dependent on uh, the government spending. Um, uh, fiscal intervention. Uh, Handouts, um, helicopter money, um, assistance, and people, things like Brimla, for example. You're right, okay. you're right. Um, second is um, from unbalanced globalization to a new, more nuanced form of globalization. You're not necessarily isolation, but we are still grappling. What is the best mode and format of globalization? What kind of international trades that we want? So, I mean, this is a bigger concept, but it has implication because the third one is we are moving from market-based capitalism to populism-driven capitalism, from current form of capitalism to more communitarian capitalism, from shareholders' capitalism to stakeholders' capitalism. And this leads to the fourth uh, uh, market, so, market force. So let me just try and summarize that mm -hmm. first before we go to number four. Mm -hmm. First of all, doing more business with ourselves and mm -hmm. or the region rather mm -hmm. than with the world. Mm -hmm. That's number two. Number three, it's um, rather than your short-termism of quarterly profits, mm -hmm. maybe your, your value is measured by sustainability or, mm -hmm. or planetary uh, returns or, or equality and diversity and inclusion among people rather than sheer 
profits, right? So that's the other two, two or three mega trends you're spotting, right? You're right. And the okay. fourth one, actually, um, uh, similar to like you mentioned, is actually moving from wealth generation to wealth distribution, from inequality to inclusivity. I'm talking about the shareholders, from shareholders capitalism to stakeholders capitalism. Okay. And lastly, all of this are inflationary in nature. So we are moving from a disinflationary environment to inflationary environment. Coming back to your question just now, what does it mean for capital market? What does it mean for investment? Is that when it is inflationary environment, we need to take on more risk because you know we are in it for a real rate of returns. If my inflation now is 5 6%, that is a normal rate of inflation, so that means you have to take on more risk to give you more than that. So to the common ordinary Joe, I yeah. mean, we've been speaking in Greek for the last 20 minutes, right? Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what appears to me to be Greek, uh -huh. let alone for the 18-year-old or the 25-year-old mm -hmm. novice investor, right? Mm. How does that person navigate this world? Okay, if you have uh, money in a savings account that gives you less than 2%, it's about time for you to consider FD and more. It's all about asset allocations because that uh, money in the bank, that money in your savings account will actually not be able to fund your daily needs, let alone for your savings uh, uh, for, for, for retirement. Okay, so real situation, right? Mm. Novice investor, 25 years old, doesn't believe in capital markets, doesn't understand bond markets, mm. knows FD is poisonous, right? Mm. Not poisonous, but it's just to be left alone by its own. Mm. So um, novice investor, 25 year old, has put money into Bitcoin, mm -hmm. okay, November 2021. Mm. Put some in Bitcoin, put some mm. in Ether, Mm. Took a bit of a risk, bought some Solana, bought some um, Cardano, right? Mm. Between those four assets within mm. the crypto space mm. are now down 65% mm. to 94%, right? Mm. Solana's fallen through the cracks. Mm. It's, I think, 12 bucks right now, mm -hmm. okay? Mm. He, he took on more risk or she took on more risk, mm. but it didn't pay off. What do they do? Okay, you have to understand finance is all about information asymmetry. If you are not in a position... Information asymmetry or symmetry? Asymmetry. Asymmetry. Right? If you are not in a position to actually gather as much information, do research, you are handicapped, you've got so much constraint, you're better off just buying unit trust. Seriously, that is finance. Because a lot of people think that they know market better. That's a problem. That's why we have a group of professionals who charge us fees because they do a lot better research, we thought. At least we pay them that yeah. for that. Yeah. Right? So that's my first question. A lot of people think that just because um, there is inflation, I have to take on more risk, I'll do it myself. You know, maybe not in a better position to do it yourself. So that's my point. Uh, you need to know whether you are constrained. Finance is all about information asymmetry. Yeah. A market is not efficient. So basically the message is either do your own research, put it in the hard yards, mm. or give it to the professionals to manage for you. You're right. Do the professionals do a good job though? Can they, have they done a good job? I mean, some research points out that mm. uh, six out of every 10 fund managers, or maybe more, I think seven out of every 10 fund managers mm -hmm. globally mm -hmm. have failed to beat the index. You're right. So you should have just bought the index. You're right. It could be. Especially if you are in an inflationary environment. If you cannot outbeat the market and you know the way market is constructed, you know the way benchmark is constructed, you know the way index is constructed. If you think that uh, active fund managers would not be able to give you a super returns, you're better off buying passive funds. Okay. So you've come from the active fund management side, mm. right? There are years in, I think, Co-op and, 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 uh, and a couple other funds as well. How do you read the next three to five years? Where does one allocate their funds? Okay. Well, either the best time now or the, still the worst time. What's your point of view? Right. Uh, so coming back to that five secular forces, so you know my, my advice would be towards taking on a bit more risk. Yeah to generate real rate of return, okay. right? And it comes from uh, different asset classes. It comes from equity, it comes from credit, um, but you need to also need to know, uh, it's not just asset class risk, it's a market risk. How much money you want to put in emerging market, how much money you want to put in the developed market. If you ask me, the, tilt of ba the, 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 the balance is actually moving towards emerging market. And I can see that there is a misprice here, uh, and there's an opportunity for us. Okay, so. Mm -hmm. Put some flesh on that bone, right? Mm. Emerging markets, Latin mm. America, uh, S S South Asia, mm. Southeast Asia, mm. capital markets, bond markets, cryptocurrencies, mm. what? Where? Right. Like I said, equity, credit, emerging market, overdeveloped market. Within emerging market, perhaps you look at the private market instead of public market. How, because does, a, how does a normal guy participate in the private market though? 
if you can't have access, like again, there's so much frictions uh, in capital market in accessing financial products, um, you're better off uh, with a professional fund manager. Okay, so advice to the young, right? Mm -hmm. um, where are the top three destinations for professional fund management for the best returns and for the best peace of mind? Okay, I'm not in, in, in a position to give investment advice of course, uh, of course. when it comes to... Maybe speak in categorical terms. Right, right. You, <laughs> let's say if you can't have access to the market directly, yeah, yeah? Uh, because constraints, because frictions, uh, because of information disadvantage, uh, you're better off uh, getting unit trust, mm. uh, equity um, that has exposure into emerging markets, um, maybe you even need to look at P2P, for example, or uh, um, ECF uh, to get exposure to one, you know, uh, the brightest spot of uh, uh, emerging market, which is in the private space. Um, so, yeah, um, these are some of the uh, potential alternatives for oh, you to see. consider. So peer-to-peer so -peer lending, uh, equ um, equity crowdfunding. Mm. E equity crowdfunding, of course, you, you take a small stake in the business, mm. right? Peer-to-peer, mm. -peer, I think you get some kind of like annual, it's like a coupon, la, right? You get it's a, credit, actually. It's credit, actually. Yeah, but you lend for people money. La. Again, we're speaking this for retail, for, yeah, yeah. for millennials, like you mentioned. Of course, yeah, yeah. my advice for institution would be different. Yeah, uh, yeah. But yeah, if you want to have exposure to credit, emerging market space, like I said, P2P. Yeah. So how do you evaluate um, each of these instruments? How do you, what kind of like thought process? Because if we're trying to teach people how to fish mm. rather than giving them the fish, what kind of things should they be watching out for? Just read. You know, nobody is born having the capacity to decent patterns. So you just need to read. The more information you have, uh, the better you are at it. Uh, but of course, uh, we lump it everything up in you know what we call as information but you know in life it's actually there are noises there are information real there are fake news they're not so fake news um yeah i think that is experience uh yeah so so a, a, a very experienced or and or a very successful even experience fail to dissent yeah exactly. uh, patterns and yeah. differentiate between fake and not so fake news yeah so <laughs> in in trying to make the right investment decisions right you mm. talk about reading as well mm. but i remember back in the day i think in the 90s or was it late late 90s this is a guy called henry blodgett right mm. i think former merrill lynch analyst who who famously mm. i think was he was a consumer analyst mm. so he actually went down to the shop floors and to the malls and department stores mm. and he looked at footfall and and then he made, I guess, educated guesses in terms of which stocks to buy. I think you did something similar when you bought Marks and Spencers when you were working in London. Yeah. You actually went down to the shop floors and mm. had a look at what people were buying, right? Mm. So when people talk about investment, it's not always about reading. Mm. Because the next question is, what do you read? But mm. also, what do you talk about? Who do you talk to? What do you see? Where do you go? Mm -hmm. To get the feel. Because at the end of the day, markets mm. is basically people doing stuff. Yeah. Right? You're right. Market is intersection between economics and psychology. That's right. Right. So, of course, you need to read a lot. You need to make a common sense. Yeah. You need to observe. Um, that sets you apart from normal, mediocre investors. Yeah. So, um, what happened with Marks and Spencers? You, you famously, I think, you were on record. Right? Yeah. It, it was unloved at the time, but then you were, you put some money behind it, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's certainly a, a, an example of value investing, in my view. Uh, one day on my way back to, uh, to, to home after work, um, I stumbled upon this building, Mark and Spencer, a huge building in Oxford Street, and I um, discovered uh, there is an insignia, uh, uh, an emblem uh, on the wall of the building, and I realised that this is actually, could potentially be the uh, property, right? Um, and this is 2012, when uh, London is seeing... Uh, 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 he was in his debt, so, so he's on his knees, right? Yes, yes, yeah. uh, yep, toying with the double, double dip. Double dip. That's right. That's what people 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 thought at the time, yeah. which happened to be uh, untrue um, or wrong. Um, and at the same time, you also see the property market in London start to creep up because of low interest rate. So I thought, okay, that potentially could be an asset back rich assets in, in the balance sheet. And uh, after that, I discovered it's true. Uh, they have a lot of assets in, 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 in the balance sheet. Most of them are property and some of them are not uh, being revalued recently. So, um, and I realized that uh, net tangible assets is uh, greater than the market cap. Yeah, and intrinsically it was worth much more than the share price suggested. Yeah, yeah. So and that's also the reason why private equity is eyeing for, for Mark and Spencer shares. Yeah, of course, right now as you speak. So right now, 2022, right? Mm. Where are the opportunities? Mm. Um, I mean, obviously, Bitcoin is, what, 16,000 is 
mm. from 62,000 a year mm. ago. Mm. I don't know, Solana was 240 at one time, now it's 12 mm. bucks. It's mm. like 5% of its value. Mm. Um, Facebook has lost its pants, right? Mm. Meta has lost hundreds of billions. Mm. And it's, uh, I think it's about, about 75 bucks. I can't remember, right? Mm. Um, Amazon is down. Alphabet is down. Tech mm. is down. A lot of stuff is down. Mm. Um, what, what do you do? I think there are opportunities, uh, inequities, because there is a so-called um, uh, dislocations in the market. Um, now, most of the tech stocks are batch, uh, down 30-40%. Uh, Amazon, like you mentioned, um, unjustifiably being uh, uh, punished for all the moonshot projects that they did, for all the cash that they burned, or so-called investment that they did. Uh, but I think there is a realization in technology space, technology companies, uh, that we need to have some form of a discipline when it comes to capital budgeting. And I think they will come to that. And uh, after that, I think uh, uh, potentially a good time for you to invest and accumulate. Because um, I, I fail to see why uh, earnings continue to go up. Uh, it's just that we are punishing them uh, for, um, for, um, for the so-called capital legacy. What about other things like um, property, real estate, um, you know, other, other areas like that? Mm. You know, other asset classes, the more mm. conventional ones. How do you see those? Mm. As an individual, uh, again, I'm quite biased in this. I don't see the need that you need to own more than three houses. Um, I'm, I'm, again, this is my personal view uh, as an individual investor. Um, for my personal portfolio, uh, because the asset is illiquid. Um, actually, to be honest with you, a lot of people do not um, quantify or do not take into account a salary cost. So actually, the real rate of return could be negative, negative equity, yeah. uh, not just you're mortgage. Carry, right? Yes, yeah. not just mortgage. If you're living, if you're buying condominiums, <laughs> management fees and stuff like that are not taken into consideration when you calculate proper return uh, or, or rental yield. So that's what I said. I think um, personally, I'm quite biased. But as an institutional investor, um, there are spots for, uh, um, uh, you know, there's space and scope for you to actually accumulate property portfolios that give you uh, real yield. Okay, so since we are talking about large global secular trends, you, you talked about five of them, right? Uh, let us talk about the concept of value. Let's talk about the concept of wealth, right? Because mm. we, well, certainly for me, I've come from an era of... Um, you know, um, people thinking about wealth as an, as an accumulation mm. of material stuff, cash, mm. assets, properties, cars, whatever, right? Mm. Um, we are fast coming to the stage where a lot of people don't see those mm. as, as embodiments of wealth anymore because mm. especially when you travel, you see a lot of young people traveling mm. and then you talk to them, um, they don't own properties, they certainly don't own cars, mm. they take a lot of public transport, mm. um, they've in fact sold their house and their mm. stuff to go traveling mm. because they see wealth in... I don't know, in time terms or in youth terms and, and for YOLO terms, right? Mm. Um, well, what do you think about those things? Right. Um, on, on that note, I'll be a little bit more um, contrarian and controversial, Su Chuang, because I know it might not be popular to your typical listeners uh, and audience. Um, when we talk about wealth, it's greater than income, right? And we know factors of productions, uh, real capital, you have natural capital, you have labor, you have capital as in financial capital. Um, wealth is actually um, more sticky, right? We more all sticky. Not, stickier. Stickier. St stickier in the sense in terms of gap. <laughs> you're right. Because is, if you're born rich, you know, what is the chance? You know, what are the chances of a of a of a of Kampung boy from from Slim River? try to accumulate wealth, try to even get to where you are presently. So that's why wealth is actually um, a, a, a sticky concept. If you're born rich, if you have a certain form of financial capital, capital breeds. Of course, there's a return on that capital. Precisely. So that's why we have this populism, because people don't understand why rich growth is below the real return of the capital market. And we, you know, adamant we do not want capital gain tax. We do not want inheritance tax. Why do we have to take tax uh, uh, heavily dependent on, uh, on income tax? So people talk about income tax, a progressive income tax. People don't really look at the tax structure in total. Are we progressive enough? What we don't tax wealth. We don't tax capital, financial capital. Yeah. We only tax labor. 
Well, that's because, well, whether you want to call it um, Washington or Capitol Hill or whether you want to call it Putrajaya, mm. um, Fed, um, Capitol Hill is dominated by the lobby groups who are owned by the billionaires. And that's why, you, you know, the rich get richer, partly, uh, and the poor get poorer. Mm. So for the 99% of people who are not born rich, mm. what do they do? I would love to see a day where people talk about inclusivity, about the wealth distribution, uh, because I think we are having a, a real structural problem of widening wealth inequality. Yeah. If you ask me, even if I ask them, put all the money you have in equity, you will never be able to actually reach the same status of those people who are born uh, in uh, top 10%, let alone top 10, 1%. Mm, mm. That's just that. Life is unfair, I must say. And everyone uh, has constraints. Uh, in, I'm sure you've read, you would have read um, Ray Dalio's uh, Principles. Quite extensive writings mm. the last two years, right? Mm. Mm. Um, Ray Dalio, of course, Bridgewater, he's, he's been analyzing history in the last, you know, uh, world orders for the last 500 years, right? Mm. He talks about how wealth disparity now is at its greatest in a long time. Mm. And the last time we saw this wealth disparity was mm. in, 19, in the late 30s mm. when the Second World War broke, up, broke out, mm. right? What do you think of his writings? Do you agree with him? I agree. In fact, I want to stretch that point a little bit. It's not 1930s, it's 1870s. And that's where people questions about globalization. Mm -hmm. We had a financial crash in the 1870s. And as a result of that crash, led to the rise of what we know now as populism. What happened if populism is not checked? People are hard on immigrations. The Americans were anti-Chinese at that point in time. Again, rhetoric, mm. yeah. uh, emotions. So we need to check this populism. But the cause of it is real and it's structural which is a widening wealth inequality. I see some semblance between 1870s, 1930s, and where we are today. You know, the problem with capitalism is because it rewards the risk seekers, mm. it rewards the owners of capital because you get a return on them. Mm. For those who don't have the capital or who don't have the propensity to earn the capital, mm. then they get poorer because mm -hmm. they're then working hand to mouth, day to day, to mm. survive, right? Mm -hmm. The problem is the only system we have right now, the only game in town, the only rodeo in town mm -hmm. is the capital markets. Mm -hmm. And that's why every few years we've got this cycle of boom and bust and mm -hmm. what have you, right? Mm -hmm. It seems as if we are making the same, not mistakes, but we are not really evolving the system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is why we are in this situation. Do you, what, what do you think about that? Because it's deeply ingrained. The system is deeply ingrained. And the balance is not, uh, um, it's not inclusive. I'll, 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 I'll talk a bit about this. Uh, sorry if I go very uh, uh, basic and very conceptual here. Uh, after the 1930s, you know, the way we uh, approach our systems, our institutions, our politics, our economics, our market, is just either A or B, right? Cold War. After the World War II, it's either the West or the East. It's either the capitalists or the communists. I must say that there is an end of universalism, right? What actually will rise is actually the rise of contextualism. People need to know a world before 19th centuries where the Chinese civilization can thrive together with the Western civilization. Western civil civilization coincides and coexists with Islamic civilizations. Context is important. That's why I think um, I'd like to see what's happening in China because they're grappling with that. Because what I, the idea of capitalism is not necessarily the Western definition of capitalism. So we are divided into two school of thoughts. We always thought that what is right is Western liberal democracy slash Western capitalism market base. Do you think we don't fall into the trap of World War this time around? Do you think that we go the opposite direction and, and find the perspective? Yes, I think so. Think so? I'm one of those who don't believe in Francis Fukuyama that the end of history is when Berlin Wall collapsed. Mm. No. I think we are still searching for truth. That's why I said at the start of this uh, chat, uh, Su Chuang, um, it's all about history, right? And what I, we discuss is what we have seen in 18th centuries, in 19th centuries, what we have seen in the past. I can talk about the 15th centuries, the advent of printing. Suddenly we have what we now know as fake news. Have you heard about the um, witch hunting? That was the it's first fake, fake news. news. Yes, because <laughs> right. the advent of printing. The witches, yeah. Right. So a lot of things we can learn from history. 
But one thing we actually fail is that hist historical outcomes are not distributed like a bell curve. Of course. So, so a lot of fake tales. We need to grapple with fake tales. We talk about race at the start of the chat. So historical outcomes are fake tales. Distribution. Number two, there's no linearity. There are too many factors to be, co to be considered. There are too many paradoxes and permutations. So that's why uh, decision making is not perfect. So you're saying history does not repeat itself. We do not descend into a third world war, at least in military terms. Mm -hmm. And uh, we find a way out of this. Yes. Uh, when people talk about um, Taiwan conflict, uh, uh, people talk about Cold War. But what we are actually afraid of is actually hot war. A yeah. physical yeah. war, uh, a physical yeah. aggression. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, which well, there's, we thought, there's five types of war, yes, right? Yeah. Yes, because we make a judgment in thinking that, hey, in the past 60, 70 years, after 1930s, it's all called war. Look before that. We've got wars because of, uh, because of uh, um, uh, different ideologies. Do you remember the uh, Crusades in the 16th century? Oh, yeah. Yes. Horrible times. Yes. Again, so again, emotion runs high uh, um, and, and that risk still remains. How do you see Malaysia? Mm. A very broad question. Mm. A very open-ended question, Taufik. How do you read Malaysia? Where does Malaysia go from here? Uh, you, you, you know, despite fake and not so fake news about the state of Malaysia and our capital market being uh, uh, terribly hopeless, um, actually, we occupy a unique position because we are blessed with diverse capital endowments, either demographic, either natural capital, uh, or even financial capital, because we have relatively a matured uh, yeah. pension yeah. uh, industry in yeah. Malaysia. But we are not rising to our full potentials. Reason is because we are still dogmatic. Um, we are too, um, uh, you know, um, uh, what do you call it, divisive. Our system is divisive. But actually, what we need to know is that this country is so diverse that we need to be able to tell, tolerate a diverse set of views. Uh, uh, our population uh, um, experience a, a, a diverse set of life experiences, um, have a different kind of perspectives. Um, so we need to know that. You know, we always talk that, you know, we are blessed because we are multi-ethnic, multicultural, we are diverse. You also know that diversity, there is a grey line between diversity and division. So, of course. Yeah. Of course. Hopefully, you know, we have, we have uh, good leaders, we have good leaderships, uh, we have good governments, we have good policies that appreciate and harness the true uh, strength of diversity and not tip us towards division. So, so it seems to me, Taufik, mm. that that the world, not just Malaysia, has not had the presence of statesmen like we used to have in the 60s and 70s. Mm. The Churchills, the Gandhis, mm. you know, um, the, those, those kind of people. It's not just Malaysia, it's, it's the US. I mean, mm. I, I don't think you can call Boris Johnson mm. a statesman, nor mm. could you have called Donald Trump a statesman, mm. nor can you call Joe Biden a statesman. And let's mm. talk, talk about Malaysia, right? Mm. Mm. Because Malaysia, mm. for all those attributes you talked about, could and should have had statesmen mm -hmm. of the likes of Tun Razak, for example, right? Mm -hmm. Who would have celebrated education, mm -hmm. uh, merits, mm -hmm. hard work, productivity, diplomacy, manners, mm -hmm. morals. Mm -hmm. We haven't had that in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. Why do you think the current era does not foment statesmen like we used to have? And I'll be contrarian here. Yeah. Because most of us think that our solution is in politics. And you know, politics is divisive by nature. Right? So maybe perhaps the solution will not come from politics. So here, uh, my point is, don't, 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 don't think that you know, general election will solve all our problems. That's my point, right? Uh, or selections of cabinet, uh, or how the government is formed. It's a solution to our problem. Like I said, politics is divisive in nature uh, and toxic too. It's a popularity contest. You're right. And we are now uh, seeing populism because there's so much dissatisfaction with our system, either capitalist system or even, like I said, globalization uh, system. So a lot of um, uh, discontentment, disengagement, populism. Uh, and here there is a challenge. You remember I've talked about the five secular forces, and this is a challenge because you, if you know that you know, the government's role is to redistribute, 
redistribute wealth. Yeah. If you understand economics, right, I tax the corporates, I tax the individual, I take the money, I redistribute it for public goods. So the agent of redistribution is actually government. And if we do not have trust in the government and the system, we are in deep trouble. So if politics is not the answer, if the private sector won't step up and offer a statesperson or mm. statesman, mm. then where do they come from? From the civil service? It's, it's okay, let me, let me correct you. It's not about the system. We don't have to reinvent the system. Uh, but we need to bring back the system to its original function. You mentioned about business. Business is by nature is innovative, right? It's driven by entrepreneurs. We need to give it purpose, right? Government comes with power uh, and it's very essential. You need to make sure they remain accountable. You need to check their abuses, right? Uh, similarly for finance. Finance is a service. It must serve society. So we need to go back to the original mandate of these institutions. We not reinvent. It's just that people do not know um, how to become a government. They still remain in politics, in politicizing government. When you are in the position of government, you should govern the country. Um, enough politicking. Like I said, politics is for the general elections. Once it does settle, we are in the business to govern. No, I agree with you. I'm on the same page. Mm. The things, the road to reform only can begin once one acknowledges one's frailties. Mm. But the problem is we haven't acknowledged our own frailties thereby stopping our path to reform. Mm. Because as you say, finance has lost its way. Mm. Finance is not, a, not about fee income or, or listing companies. It's mm. about providing capital to needy businesses. Yeah. That's how banking started. Yeah. We've lost our way. Wall Street lost its way years ago. Yeah. Still it's lost its way. Mm. Governments, as you say, hasn't uh, acknowledged this true function, which, which is to govern the country. That's why we have an Occupy movement. That's yeah. why we have a populism. Yeah. That's why we have Trump. Yeah. At one point. And he might come back. And yes. Boris Johnson might come back. Right. right? I don't question the wisdoms of American uh, voters. But that reflects, again, um, the needs of the populations. We, you know, we are not in the business of to pass normative judgment here. But my point is, populism could give rise to tyranny. Right? And so it has what, in the past. As yeah. you say, history repeats itself. Yes. 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 That's my point. So what is the um, road, road ahead? What is the advice to the young? Read more. Do your own research, right? What else? Adaptable. Because what is certain is we will be dealing with risks and uncertainties. <laughs> like I said, be flexible and adapt. Um, I'm pretty sure you come across uh, Karl Marx's quote, right? Uh, it's not the brightest, it's not the strongest of species that survive, nor the brightest. is the one that is uh, ad most adaptable to change. What are the hallmarks of adaptability? What, what amounts to resilience? So certainly not physical strength, of course, right? Mm. It's up here, right? You're right. The thing is, if people are given, uh, let's just say, assistance, mm. right? Mm. How strong can they be upstairs? Can they? Okay. You, you, again, um, that function of resilience, robustness, not just come from uh, educations, not come from uh, schools, comes from your life experiences, right? Um, we mentioned about why, for example, Malaysia lagging behind other countries. Uh, we have a part to blame. Of course. Because our system doesn't encourage risk-taking activities. We're highly subsidised. Yes, highly subsidised. We don't encourage risk-taking activities. We are afraid if our kids end up being an entrepreneur and join startups. We want them to end up to be a doctor, you know, and become civil servants or, or work with big four. As a parent, unlike our peers who have seen crisis time and time again and relearn and learned, we have seen China. They've got revol revolution from bottoms up. They are so used to having um, uh, um, you know, difficulties during cultural revolution, gave birth to a more resilient society. We have seen that in Indonesia, crisis after crisis. So if you ask me for Malaysia contacts, we all have a part to blame. To remove that assistance, hmm. it's, it's, it's an unthinkable idea, right? Do you think so? Yeah. Thinking the unthinkable has yeah. become a common chatter. <laughs> yeah, but if you remove the policy which assists people, hmm. it's anathema, right? It's hmm. like, oh my God, no, no, no way, right? Hmm. But you and I know the only way you can ride a bicycle is by first falling down, hmm. right? You're right. Of course, you should not fall down again because hmm. then you'll be bloody stupid, right? Hmm. 
But that's the whole idea. Life and success is all about making less mistakes and learning from them so then you can become a bigger and better person. You're right, so strong. That's why we need to do more. <laughs> we need to educate our people. That resilience and robustness do you think Malaysia is a function there? of life experiences. Yeah. We need to tolerate failures. Yeah. Tolerate more risky yeah. activities. Be more adventurous. Start a business. That's how you be adaptable. Mistakes, yeah. You're right. Lose a bit of money in the markets, but mm. learn from it. Don't make the same bloody thing again. Great move forward begins with a leap of faith. That's my point. We have to take chances in life. Okay. I'm going to leave this conversation with you, summarizing your thoughts into three nuggets. Taufik, can you mm. do that? Sure. Um, that's a challenge. Um, read, adapt, anti-fragile. Anti-fragile. Be resilient. Mm. Copy the man. Thank you so much, Tafik. Thank you very much, Sushwang. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Excellent.